It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 335 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 16th of June 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hi. And Joe Benamou. Hello. And as always, a quick reminder that if you go to scienceontop.com slash donate, you can sign up to be a Patreon. You can donate as little or even as much money as you like. Well, as you can afford. <laughs> That all helps us cover our costs and keep the servers running. So a big thank you to everyone who has already chipped in. Much appreciated. Now, Penny, it's a cold Sunday night here, which means it's well and truly wine o'clock. And fortunately, our first story is all about wine. Ancient wine, in fact. And it's well known that the French are extremely proud of their long history of winemaking. There's archaeological evidence of wine being made in France as early as 12,000 years ago. And of course, over that time, grape varieties have changed, new varieties cultivated, and so on. But new research has been looking at the DNA of ancient grapes and found one particular grape that's remained unchanged for over 900 years, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. And I find this fascinating. And I think wine and wine itself there's this huge sort of fascination and mystique in popular culture I remember when I was quite young reading a short story I think it was by Roald Dahl I'm not going to swear that but um you know it was people were sitting around tasting wines with no labels and like oh yes this was definitely on you know from a you know a winery on this hill on this side of the hill and it was harvested in the spring and you know guessing wines from all over the, the world but probably really all over France and there's so much about, you know, what kinds of grapes, the soil, the, um, you know, the, the season, the harvest, how it's treated that influence the kind of wine. But obviously, I think, you know, different kinds of grapes give different kinds of wines. Now, I don't know a lot about wine, but, you know, there's Pinot Noir grapes. Pinot Noir grapes are different from, you know, Sauvignon Blanc grapes and so on. So this grape is quite interesting grapes were domesticated a long time ago but it seems like some of the grape varieties that are being used in France have basically not changed for 2000 years or you know since the since Roman times so they study the the study looked at um DNA from 28 grape seeds found at nine different archaeological sites and these are often found um in you know latrines or waste pits so they're places where people would have just essentially once something had been stopped used for its general purpose, just chucked it away. But they can have a look at the, um, the surrounding artifacts and get a feel for how old some of the pips are. So but some if, of them were if familiar. we've just got the pips, sorry to interrupt though, if we've mm. only got the pips, we don't necessarily know whether they were just eating the grapes themselves or whether they were using it as wine making do we? We don't know, but we know that the grapes grew in the region and we know that wine was made in the region. Okay. So, and if the, you know, so we, and you know, and what I'm going to talk about later too is we don't know how that wine was made and so on. We know that uh, Roman wines, for example, and Greek wines were drunk in very different ways to how we drink wine today. So they probably were tasted different and were made different and were stored differently and so on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we, we don't know for sure that these um, pips were made wine. They are um, dumped. So, but it also does suggest like after you've made wine, you need to get rid of those seeds. They don't become part of the wine. You know, all the people squishing the grapes to get mm -hmm. the juice out. And so you would dump them in somewhere that wasn't being used anymore. So these dumps of seeds are possibly... Um, related to winemaking rather than just individual grapes being eaten. But what was found is that um, there were some grapes that were essentially, they tested all these different points in, I think 10,000 different points in the DNA. They're the same as grapes being used today. Um, 
not Sauvignon Blanc. I'm not very good at this. Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon. Which is a yeah. Sauvignon. Yeah. So not the one that you know, a slightly different <laughs> one, um, which is genetically identical to one that are used today. So what this means is that for at least 900 years, people have been propagating these vines by cuttings. So instead of reproducing sexually, like, you know, with bee, the bees pollinating the flowers and so on, they've just been reproducing asexually by people. Clones have been found spread, you know, hundreds of kilometres apart, which suggests that, um, you know, people were again doing this. So if you're, it's, if you're, you know, taking a cutting of a really important grapevine and putting it somewhere else, it wouldn't have happened naturally. People are probably the best vector for that to happen. And when you look at some of the Roman wines or the ones dating from the Roman era, they're not the same as modern varieties, but there are so few differences that you can suggest that in about 2000 years, there was one reproductive cycle. Mm. So that means for 2000 years, you know, the, this particular variety of grape only reproduced once. So people have been maintaining them by cuttings and so on for that long, propagating them for that long. So I just thought this was really fascinating. It doesn't, what, it, what I was thinking is, oh, so these ancient grapes, so the wine made from these grapes is the same as, you know, what people would have drunk in Roman times mm. or in medieval times. Not so much um, techniques and, you know, the conditions of the soil and so on are just as important in wine as the kind of grape. But um, it is interesting showing, you know, the tradition in that area, but also I guess um, some of the problems that come with with that. So a lot of other crops that we have are constantly being bred and altered, even genetically modified to be resistant to, pe to pests or so on. But these grapes aren't evolving. Mm. They're stuck in time in an evolving world. And which means they're much more susceptible, wouldn't it? To I'm sure, yeah. And I've, I've read that grapes do, you know, there is a huge amount of pesticide use. But I think because there's that romance and mystique about wines, I mean, yeah, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not like trying to be a Monsanto apologist. Or something, <laughs> but instead of buying, you know, Monsanto's new red grape super plus or whatever. Roundup ready. You know, Roundup ready grapes. Um People will, or winemakers, you know, there is this huge tradition of using these varieties that, that mm. have a bit of romance about them and everything. So, But also, it's, it's a, mm. um, I hadn't even thought about that until you mentioned that, the same um, vulnerabilities then. Mm. It's the same thing that we're seeing with bananas, which are at yeah. huge risk from fungus and things like that. And I think coffee even yeah. is, yeah, under threat. So a lot of these... I guess they're not, you know, they're not necessarily daily staples, but they are really important Speak for yourself, foods. Penny. Well, no. <laughs> Wine yeah, and coffee no. are daily staples for a great many people. But we're not going to die without them. Again, speak for yourself. I speak for myself, okay. Fair enough. No. But, yeah. But it is interesting. It's interesting to think about, you know, agriculture and also a kind of agriculture that hasn't necessarily got um, profit margins and technology at the forefront, even though I know there is a lot of profit margin and technology in wine, but there's also these other priorities and such a long tradition in that region of using these same grapes and this expertise with these same kind, with not even same species, like basically same plants, yeah. which I think is fascinating. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's interesting to me mainly from a sociological point of view that you get a lot of these are family-owned vineyards that have mm. been doing it the same way for generations upon generations and they're very proud of that tradition, mm. uh, which, as you say, can have upsides and downsides. There's risks yeah. as well. So, ah, very cool. Lucas, let's move on and talk about the moon now, shall we? Sure. And people may not be aware that the largest crater in the whole solar system, or the largest universally recognised crater in the whole solar system, is on the moon, and it's called the South Pole Aitken Basin. 
and astronomers have found an unexpected, very dense patch there. There's something with a lot of mass deep below the surface. How do they detect this, and what do we think it could be? Is it aliens? <laughs> um, it's always aliens. Okay. It's, it's never aliens. Oh. Um, so, yes, uh, first of all, I think we need to rewind just for a second and just um, acknowledge that the largest crater we know yeah. of in the solar system is on the moon. I didn't know that. I didn't no. know that at all. I, no. Not a clue. And it's on the far side of the moon. We never get to see it. We don't get to see it. It's kind of, you know, the, 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 the southern part of the far side of the moon, thus the South Pole Aiken Basin. Um yeah, we don't get to see it, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but it's a freaking big crater. I mean, obviously, being the largest crater that we know of in the solar system, we would expect it to be a freaking big crater. But it's um, it's about 2,500 kilometres in diameter. It's about 13 kilometres deep. That's a, That's a big, big crater. crater. That is a big <laughs> crater. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so uh, how was this... Uh, how was this found, you asked? So do you remember the GRAIL mission, um, which was the, the gravity um, uh, mapping mission of the moon? Um, do you remember that? 2011 remember? or so? It was about Yeah, launched in 2011, ran, ran for a, a, about a year uh, mapping the, the moon's gravity. And we, we covered it at some point um, on, on the show, but basically just to remind you, the, there were, the GRAIL mission had two spacecraft that were basically um, orbiting the moon and they, they were nicknamed Ebb and Flow. And so they were actually Grail A and Grail B, but they were, they were nicknamed Ebb and Flow. I and remember that. The, yeah, so they were they were basically going around. They were, they were just in orbit around the moon, and as um, as they flew over areas of the moon that had different masses, then the closer one moved a little bit clo- uh, further towards or closer towards the moon, and they they moved a little bit toward or away from each other. So it was the the reference of moving toward or away from each other that gave them the ability to map the the gravity of the moon. So that's kind of cool. That's um, so cool. We've talked about yeah, we've talked about mapping the gravity of Earth before. Earth is quite lumpy with its gravity. It's not you know it's not a sphere. Um, there's there's parts of Earth that are that are more gravitationally. Um, <coughs> Dense, massive. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, when you box yourself into a word for it, you go, "How do I get out of this word?" Like, I don't want to repeat no, the words go. I've been using the last three sentences, but <laughs> there's so gravitation I have in to there. Just stop talking. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it, it was a combination of, of Grail, and it was also. Um, using the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was another mission that was uh, in orbit around the moon. The, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was tasked with, with mapping the lunar topography, so the features like the craters and mountains and stuff like that that are on the moon. So by combining the data from both of those missions, there's some really, really cool graphics um, that you should have a look at, which are all sort of false color graphics that have been used to accentuate different elevations um, from the LRO. And then um, you've got the the ebb and flow data, which is also in in some really cool looking um, graphics, just showing the the density, the you know the the mass with uh, the creates more gravitational pull um, and what is interesting is that this particular study has identified that there's a really really um, gravitationally dense um, um, area more or less coinciding with this massive crater it's not perfect but it's perfect enough that it seems unlikely that it would be just a coincidence so question is, what is it? Um, it appears like it, we don't know for starters. We don't know what it is yet, but it, but certainly the most likely explanation would be a really dense um, impactor, an asteroid or something like that, that uh, might have been very metal rich. Just think sort of, you know, concentration of, of, of iron and nickel that, that might be um, within 
the mantle underneath this area. But what is interesting, what's particularly interesting, is if that were the case, and it does seem the most likely um, scenario, it would also mean that because this impact crater is so old, um, this impact crater is thought to be um, not too long after the formation of the moon. So, we, you know, the current theory is that um, uh, a Four planet, a sort of a Mars-sized yeah. object, say that again? Four and a half billion years ago. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the current thinking is that a, a, a sort of planet-sized object called Thea smacked into Earth um, and, and basically you know, a whole lot of material was ejected and, and coalesced into the moon. Um, so, so it's not long after that, um, that this crater was formed. So it obviously must have been after the moon had cooled sufficiently so that it was no longer just a ball of molten rock. Um, it's, uh, so it had a crust, but it, it's very interesting that this density, this, this material is not too far from the surface because that means that the inside of the moon mustn't be very gooey, uh, for want of a better term, because otherwise it would have sunk into the middle, oh, I um, and that doesn't appear to happen. Yeah. So it's basically so, it's parmesan rather than brie. <laughs> right. Oh, exactly so right. For the it moon. is right. <laughs> now I want some. Now I want some what, brie. What, anyway, what um, isn't now? Isn't now? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there are other possibilities. It could could be a layover from the uh, cooling of the moon. So as the as the moon cooled from that molten state, it may have actually cooled unevenly and caused a an area of um, uh, a certain type of mineral to be formed, uh, which is in some of my notes here somewhere, but I can't remember what it's called. Um, Ilmenite. Uh, that's the one. Say it again. Ilmenite. I L M E N I T. Ilmenite. Right. That. F E T I O three. If that helps. Thank you. Uh, and I again, I know it's here somewhere in my notes, <laughs> but I can't because I've got three articles here that cover this, uh, including the synopsis of the original study. Um, and yeah, so it's possible that that the the cooling. Uh, may have actually caused this, uh, or may may have may have resulted in a, in a denser area because of the the way that uh, the cooling occurred. It again, it doesn't seem as likely that was the impact as simply because it lines up so well with this crater. So yeah, it's cool. It caught my attention because mainly I didn't know that there was a mm. biggest crater in the solar system that we know of um, right next door, which is really cool. So we know that this lump of presumably metal is below this crater. Do we know like how deep, how far below? Is this something that we could mine, for example, or are we talking close to the core? Uh, so it, it was described as likely to be within the upper mantle uh, of the moon. So one of the articles, and I, I normally put these things in the show notes, I assume you'll have it in there. One of the articles, which I think was the one from the uh, Universe Today mm -hmm. uh, website, great website, um, that one has got a, uh, a picture or a graphic showing the, the layers of the moon. So it is felt that it's in the upper mantle, so it would be relatively close to the surface. But uh, just to put that into perspective we're still talking about potentially hundreds of kilometers below the surface so it's not something we're likely to kind of just be able to dig out with a pick <laughs> and probably an expensive operation until we really 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 need iron or nickel desperately right hmm. yes that's possibly we need bruce willis's crew <laughs> up there to do this one at least it would make sense that they were there anyway Yes, instead of if you don't a know movie that we don't to. mention. Yeah, I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> Armageddon. Anyway. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't help it. Oh, I just found that ill yes. Yeah, there you go. Joe, let's talk about some medical imaging. And people may be familiar with PET scans, positron emission tomography, which are scans that show levels of chemical activity in the body. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, 
but cancers, for example, will often show up because they tend to have a higher metabolic rate than other cells. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so tell us about the new modified PET scanners that have been demonstrated at a research symposium last week. Really cool diagnostic technology, actually, and with therapeutic applications as well, which is quite interesting. So um, the researchers here have modified a PET scanner to enable it to uh, construct 3D renderings of the, of the human body. Now, what's really clever about this, uh, what they've done, is that first of all, it can be it can it can image the entire body in as little as 20 seconds, and it also uh, uses less radiation. So it expo would expose patients to less radiation. Uh, when when PET scans are taken conventionally, um, patients have to ingest or, or have inject sorry have injected a, a radioactive tracer. Uh, and because of the fact that it takes a significant amount of time to actually image the body, uh, and because of the way uh, conventional PET scans are designed, they're only able to image small areas at a time and the traces degrade fairly quickly. So the amount of radiation that needs to be used in a PET scan can be quite high. So PET scanners, uh, uh, as I said before, can image a small area of the body at a time. And what they've done is they've connected multiple of the rings that are used in a PET scanner into a two-meter tube. And this allows them to take uh, these complete images using one-fortieth of the dose of radiation. Uh, the way PET scanners work is that they detect gamma rays. And when these uh, traces are injected, and quite often they utilize uh, glucose, which is taken up by the cells and then metabolized. And this, meta this cellular metabolism results in the release of two gamma rays. The detector then creates a 3D map of the cells as they release these rays. Um, by combining them into this tube, it allows this 3D visualization and the applications are really, really interesting. So first of all, it's very helpful potentially for imaging children. Now, when you put children in for any scan, they tend to wriggle around and, and it can be very, very difficult. And quite often, uh, you, you know, kids can require sedation for scans, uh, which again exposes them to a higher degree of risk. Um, so being able to, to reduce those risks for kids is great. And also just their experience, it's quite frightening for kids having to have scans. Uh, so the amount of time they would have to spend in the scanner would be a lot less. But also, and this is where it is particularly interesting from a scientific point of view, is it can help us study how drugs move through the body. So being able to actually visualize uh, the way uh, particular drugs are metabolized and how they travel through the body is, is quite interesting. So the way the, um, the researchers are proposing using this uh, firstly, they're wanting to look at this, uh, studying atherosclerosis, which is where plaque builds up in, in our arteries, and then to see if certain drugs can actually help treat uh, atherosclerosis. Another area that, that's quite interesting is uh, from some infectious diseases researchers uh, who've proposed using a radioactive sugar tracer, which is ingested by bacterial cells, but not mammalian cells. And what would happen, therefore, is that when the tracer is uh, exposed to the body, it would be taken up by bacteria. And if, for example, a person has an infection, you could potentially identify where that infection is in the body oh. because uh, it would only be taken up by the bacteria um and I sh we should point out also that this new modified uh, pet scanner as far as i can tell it's just a video that they've shown at this uh, symposium i haven't seen any further research or data about it no so they've only they've only the fda has only just approved uh the the device for use so oh, they okay. haven't yet actually utilized it in patients as yet but it has been approved by the fda for this purpose and they're now hoping to move on to uh application to actually sort of using it in humans Oh, that's really exciting. But but again, the, these are rapidly uh, developing areas. It's it's not one of those areas, I think, where we, we can kind of use the typical, oh, you know, we'll see results in five years. I think these are areas mm. where there's so much going on and, and so much that is actually genuinely, um, you know, being applied and, and, and sort of seeing actual, you know, diagnostic and, and treatment changes. Very exciting stuff. So we'll talk about it next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. I think that's our show. 
As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 335. Don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us make the show. Thank you, Penny, Lucas, and Joe. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. So David Attenborough has made a surprise appearance on the main stage at Glastonbury, not to perform, but as part of the campaign against plastic in the oceans. This is the first year that the festival in Somerset has banned single-use plastic water bottles from being sold on site. So David said that had saved a million bottles from being used. This year, for the first time, Glastonbury, like a growing number of places, has taken action against single-use plastics. No longer selling water, in plastic bottles and banning the use of many other plastic items. No surprise then that the festival's environmentally aware audience gave a huge reception to Sir David Thank Attenborough, you. the man who inspired the plastics ban Thank with you. an episode of Blue Planet 2. It was one in which we showed what plastic has done to the creatures that live in the ocean. That had an extraordinary effect and now this great festival has gone plastic free. He's a bit of like a dad of the, of the world almost. This is, this is the first part of the festival where I've actually felt a little bit moved.